microphone here. Bon dia, bon dia a tothom. Bé, avui tenim una sessió que fem conjuntament amb Europe G, representat per Antonio Castells, sobre un tema superinteressant, com veieu, Towers the New Fiscal Governance in the Eurozone, sobre les regles fiscals, que és un dels temes ajornats, ajornats, i que Europa ha de cometre en els propers temps. Així és que el que em va dir és que per nosaltres és un gran honor tenir-vos aquí avui, Professor De Grauwe, it's a great honor for the Circle of Economia to have you here today. Voldria també agrair la presència de la Núria Mas, que conduirà el col·loqui. I sense més dilacions, li passo la paraula a Antonio Castells, que farà la presentació del nostre ponent. I amb això comencem l'acte. Moltes gràcies a tots per atendre'ns. Senyor president del Cercle d'Economia, amic Jaume, professora Núria Mas, professor Pol de Grof, benvolgut amics, moltes gràcies al Cercle d'Economia per acollir aquest acte. And many thanks, professor de Grof, for being today among us. For me, it's a pleasure and honor to introduce you in this conference. Professor de Grof, is the author of the last policy brief published for Europe G. The subject of the brief is the reform of European rules of fiscal discipline. As you know, these rules were suspended because of COVID, and afterwards the suspension was further extended because of the Ukraine war. Even without these two very disrupting events, and before they happened, the reform of the European fiscal rules was on the table. And for me, letting aside political stances due to political consider tactical considerations, it was absolutely necessary to tackle the reform of these rules, given their severe flaws, both in practical and conceptual grounds. The paper of Professor De Grove examines this very crucial issue. He analyzes the current situation, its precedents, and makes very interesting proposals. I would like to mention two of them. Firstly, he proposed a fundamental change in the basic orientation of European fiscal rules. They should focus on qualitative targets linked to the financial sustainability of debt and need to be tailored to each particular case rather than on numerical targets, especially if these targets, as is the case, are conceptually flawed, structural deficit or potential GDP, for instance, and additionally are estimated through highly debatable and extremely complex methods. The second proposal is the application of the golden rule. It means that the ordinary budget of current operations, revenues and expenditures, should be balanced, but that public investment might and probably should be financed with public debt, both on the ground of intergenerational equity and the efficient allocation of public uh, resources. This is a crucial point because years and years of application of European rules of fiscal discipline have contributed in more or less degree to the current situation of a severe gap in public sector investment in most European countries, despite a prolonged, a prolonged period of extremely low interest rates. In my opinion, these are two highly relevant points and a very useful contribution to the current debate about this issue. This is why this paper and these proposals appear in a timely moment. The reform of European fiscal rules is, at present, 
a subject under discussion between European institutions in European Union member states. The European Commission has delivered a proposal and in the coming months, the issue will be probably in the center of political debate in the European Union. The paper of Professor De Grove is an important contribution to this debate. Professor De Grove is a scholar especially appropriate for that. He holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins University, was a professor of international economy at the Catholic University of Leuven between 1975 and 2012, and is a professor of European political economy at the London School of Economics, where he holds the John Paulson Chair in European political economy of the European Institute. He is also Dr. Honoris Causa for several universities and has been West Professor in other several universities. He is a researcher in the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels and in the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. Finally, in this brief bio that I present to you, I would also like to mention that between 1991 and 2003, he was a member of the Belgian Parliament senator and for some years the president of its financial and economic affairs committee. Professor De Grau, I repeat, it is an honor, an honor to have you among us. You have the floor. Thank you very much for these kind words of introduction. It's such a great pleasure to be in this magnificent town. I, I regularly come to Barcelona and I always enjoy uh, walking around, uh, seeing all these wonders uh, that has been produced here in the past and, and wonders of imagination, uh, wonders of cleverness and intelligence. So, it's one of the great European cities, right, that uh, one wants to be in. So I actually uh, envy you of uh, living here. I'm living in, in London now, which is also a great town, but if I had a choice between London or Barcelona, guess what? I would certainly take Barcelona, right? But they never gave me opportunity, so I'm happy in London also. So I'm going to talk about... Uh, Fiscal governance in the Eurozone, and uh, as you know, this is uh, something that becomes topical because, as uh, you were saying in the introduction, the fiscal rules have been suspended, uh, but they are likely to be reintroduced, probably not this year, but certainly next year, and there will be a lot of discussion about whether or not we have to change these rules, and I will argue that we will have to change these rules. Oops. Can, can, this be, can I turn this a little bit? Sure. I don't know, but let's try. I think it has wheels. Yeah, no? yeah, yeah. So, okay, that's perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, yeah. So when um, the Eurozone was introduced, there was this idea. No, it's fine. Yeah. There was this idea that um, if you have a monetary union, we should be sure that fiscal discipline is strong enough, right? Uh, and that actually fiscal discipline in a monetary union should be stronger than outside the monetary union. So I will, there were several arguments were made to, to, to make this plausible, but I will argue that these arguments actually are weak. Um, and that there is no need for extra discipline in a monetary union. I'm not saying there is no need for discipline, but there is no need for something extra because you are in a monetary union. And then I will go on arguing that there is a need to reform the monetary union, and particularly the stability and growth pact. Um, and I will then um, analyze how this can be done, because this is a very topical issue. So let me first turn to this first topic, you, monetary union and fiscal discipline. The idea that uh, <coughs> we need these strong fiscal rules as they are as embedded in the Stability and Growth Pact, the SGP, you remember 60%, 3%, and also the Structural Budget Balance as, as the core components of these fiscal rules. And we need that uh, for two reasons. One is um, 
you need that to make sure that government debt remains sustainable, right? otherwise this could lead to defaults and, and other financial disturbances. And uh, you also need that to avoid spillover effects. That is, if some country um, engages in unsustainable debt developments, that will actually put upward pressure on the interest rate and all the others will also suffer. So this is a spillover effect of why we need this extra fiscal boost. That these were the arguments that were used in those days to justify the stability and growth pact and the extra um, discipline for a monetary union. So the question that I'm asking now is, does a monetary union need uh, less, um, oh, sorry, no, I'm, I'm taking that, but what I want to ask now is the following. Um, do we observe in monetary union um, that there was less fiscal discipline? Because this was the prediction of people who argued that we need this discipline, that without this discipline there would be too little fiscal discipline, right? And um, so it's certainly true that the, in a monetary union you change the incentives of uh, governments, right? Uh, and, and here there are essentially two reasons why incentives of governments in a monetary union may be changed once they enter the union. And the, the first has to do with what is called the common pool problem. You know the common pool problem in economics is, is the following. You have a lake um, and there are many fishermen and there are fish in the, in, in the pool. And if you don't specify uh, property rights well, then fishermen will have the incentive to overfish and after a while there's no fish anymore, right? And, and that's the problem of the common pool, so you have to do something about it. And that's what we also use here as an argument for governments, once they enter in a monetary union, it is as if the pool of financing has been enlarged. And therefore you can all, all these governments can actually um, tap resources, financial resources from that common pool, and they will do too much of this, like the fishermen, individual fishermen catching too much fish. Um, and that will then lead them to borrow too much and have large budget deficits. And that's why we have to control this. That's one reason why in a monetary union you might have excessive deficits and debt accumulation and therefore a need to discipline in a monetary union. That's one reason. But then <coughs> there is another um, aspect to a monetary union which is important here. When governments enter a monetary union, they lose control over the currency in which they issue their debt. Right? In the past, prior to the monetary union, the debt that was issued by the Spanish government was in pesetas. And the Spanish government and the Bank, uh, the bank of Spain had full control, right? Now you are in the Eurozone, you issue debt as if it's a foreign currency. You have no control over that money. It, in fact, it's like you have become Argentina. Argentina issuing debt in dollars, losing and not having control over the issue of dollars, right? And that creates a problem of sudden stops, right? That, that creates a, a particular problem that we have seen during the sovereign debt crisis. But it also introduces a harder budget constraint for the governments. They cannot just run to the, to the bank, right? And say, hey, I have a deficit, please give me the money, Bank of Spain, right? Like they could do in the past, right? <laughs> that you did in the past, right? <laughs> and now you cannot do that any longer. And that introduces a harder budget constraint. And when you have a harder budget constraint, you will have less budget deficits, right? So we have two opposing tendencies here. The first one, the common pool that I mentioned earlier, gives incentives to issue too much debt. But the harder budget constraint, because you cannot monetize the budget deficit, tends to reduce that. So it's essentially an empirical matter, right? Do monetary unions create excessive debt and deficits? It's an empirical matter. Here is some evidence. Of course, it's not conclusive, right? More empirical research has to be done. But here I show you the government debt to GDP ratio in a number of countries, the US, the UK, and the Eurozone. I hope this is visible. Um, and what you can see is the following. Actually, the debt to GDP ratio 
in the beginning, in 2000, was higher in the Eurozone. Now it's lower than in these two other countries. In other words, these two other countries during 20 years, more than 20 years, have actually created more debt than the Eurozone countries as a whole. Right? Of course, there's a lot of variation within the Eurozone. Right? So Greece, for example, is a different story. But on average, actually, Eurozone member countries have exhibited more discipline than the US and the UK, particularly the US, right, that has seen its debt to GDP ratio more than doubling. So that is certainly very striking, right? Uh, so I have, here I give you the numbers. Um, the, the Eurozone added 26% to its debt to GDP ratio over this period, while the US more than doubled it, and the UK even more so, right? So it appears that the no monetization constraint, the hard budget constraint, d seems to work, right? And, and leads to more discipline on average than um, in other countries where they can just knock at the door of the central bank and say, give us the money, we have a deficit, right? And that's what the US and UK have done more than typical Eurozone countries. What about spillover effects? This was the second argument huh, for extra discipline, right? Um, when, when one country has too much debt and deficit, that pushes up the interest rate and the other countries suffer. So let's look at this. Here I show you, um, let me just see, oh no, I, how do I point? Ah, oh, here, I sh I, let me point here. Um, here I show you the spreads of 10-year um, government bonds. So these are 10-year government bonds in the Eurozone and the spread is the difference of each country um, interest rate with respect to the German interest rate, right? And, and here you have the following. This is prior to the Eurozone. The Eurozone started here, right? This was prior to the Eurozone. The, this number here is, that you can see is Greece, right? This, this spike here. Uh, but then I'm, I'm looking uh, Spain with somewhere here. Yeah, here, this, it's not, not very visible, right? Spain was, except here there was a problem, as you know. Um, so prior to the Eurozone, the spreads were high, but this had to do with devaluation risk, right? This, each country had its own currency. Therefore, if you bought um, Spanish peseta bonds, then as an investor, you, you wanted to have a premium because on average, the peseta tended to depreciate vis-a-vis -vis the German mark because that's the, the benchmark here, right? And that's why there was a spread. These spreads disappeared when the Eurozone started. And in fact, they were practically zero for about 10 years. And then suddenly the sovereign debt crisis erupted, right? So what does that tell us about the spillover effects, right? So here during the first 10 years, no spillover effects. This was a period where um, investors thought a Greek bond and a German bond is the same thing, same risk. When you think about it today, how come people had that in their mind? There's something wrong there, right? Uh, but that's the, that's the situation, because if you had a Greek bond, you had the same return as an, on a German bond. So that means that the, the market was saying, if you buy a Greek government bond, this is as safe as a German government bond. Well, the, the wake-up call here, I don't know, um, this is in, in June uh, 2008, we get a call. Say, Look at the numbers of Greece. Right? <laughs> and then these investors change their mind. And then you see the, the spreads exploding. Right? So, what, so during that period, no spillover. What about here? Well, no spillover either. Because what happened is that investors suddenly realized Greek bonds are highly risky. Let's raise the premium on Greek bonds. What happened with the German bonds? Nothing. Actually, the interest rates on the German bonds declined because investors sold Greek bonds and bought German bonds. And as a result, the yields on German bonds actually declined. Right? So the no spillover effects. This is a phony argument that was introduced to say in the beginning, we need extra fiscal discipline. Otherwise, if the Greek do silly things, we Germans, we also suffer. No, the Germans did not suffer at all. On the contrary, during the Greek crisis, it was good news for Germany. So there were no spillover effects. Right? So that's what I wanted to say about spillover effects. Now, so we introduced fiscal rules. Right? These fiscal rules 
of course, must find the balance between two conflicting concerns. One is a concern of flexibility. When you are in a monetary union, you lose an important instrument of economic policy, that's monetary policy. You can also not use exchange rate policy. So we are, when you are in a recession, you cannot use your own monetary policy any longer, as you used to do before. Therefore, you need fiscal policy. Right? If you have a recession, you want to stimulate your economy. You need fiscal policy, therefore you need flexibility. So that's one concern. On the other hand, you also need to maintain sustainable debts and deficits. So the fiscal rules have to find a balance between these two concerns, right? Flexibility, so that you can handle negative shocks, but also sustainability, right? And it's clear that the Stability and Growth Pact, SGB, has been unbalanced, has been much more influenced by the fear of unsustainable debts and deficits. Right? Um, and as a result, creating a risk that the capacity of national budgets to function as an automatic stabilizer um, during recession is hampered, thereby intensifying recessions. So this, this is certainly a flaw of stability and growth by not allowing insufficient flexibility. Let me go quickly to the history of the stability and growth pact, right, during moments of crisis. We had the first crisis of the stability and growth pact during the period 2002-2004. This was a, a recession, right? Um, and always during recession, fiscal deficits increase, right, inevitably, because governments have less revenue because of a downturn of economic activity and also have to spend more for unemployment, for example. And as a result, deficits increased everywhere, in particular in France, Germany, Italy and Portugal. In the name of the pact, the European Commission intervened and, and hit these countries on their head and said, reduce your budget deficit. But these countries, in particular France and Germany, said, no way, we will not obey these rules. Remember, Germany, right, at that time said, no way, we will not obey these rules. And the European Commission clashed with these governments, but actually lost the case, right? And the Commission had to yield. So this was the first crisis of the stability and growth, like indicating already that too much focus on sustainability and not on flexibility made it unsustainable politically, right? Because each time there is a crisis, then the need for flexibility will come up and the European Commission cannot avoid this. 2008 was the second crisis, the banking crisis, right? The recession that started in 2008 also led automatically to large budget deficits. And um, the first reaction, actually, of um, the policymakers was to allow for higher budget deficits. Happily, they did so, right? Um, they, this was such a big downward shock. Had they, in, had they insisted on keeping the budget balanced, in the f face of such a shock, we would have experienced terrible situations like during the 1930s where many governments actually did that in Germany during the, the deep depression, the German government prior to Hitler insisted on balancing the books, right? reducing spending and m opening the door for Hitler and, 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 and all the calamities that followed afterwards. Right? So we, we learned from that, and so the, the first reaction was the correct one. But very quickly, European policy made a change tune and insisted on tightening the pact again, right? Uh, and this led then to excessive austerity, um, in just a year or two later, and, and a double dip recession. Here I show you um, the implications. This is real GDP, uh, where I've put, I compare three countries, I'm not sure it is visible, this is the Eurozone, the is, this is called the EU8, and this is the US, I don't know why, but that, ah, this, yeah, here, this United States, that, this one here. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's the United States, that's the EU8. These are the members of the European Union, not in the Eurozone. And these are the Eurozone countries. And look what happened with um, real GDP, right? Um, this was the... the this, the severe recession of 2008, then there was a recovery in these countries, right? But look here in the Eurozone, you had a second deep recession, a new recession in 2010, 2011. That's when the authorities tightened up the stability pact again, right? Leading to a situation where actually the Eurozone has been lagging behind in terms of growth of GDP. Remember, when we started the Eurozone, we were told that the Eurozone would be 
a source of additional growth. I still remember a famous report in the 1990s predicting that members of the monetary union would experience more growth than others. Has this happened? No. It's the opposite that has happened. Also, mainly, I would say, because of ill-conceived fiscal rules, um, applying austerity when there was no need to do so, right? And then creating misery in many countries. So, and then finally, 2020, the pandemic there, I think we had learned so much of uh, bad mistakes. The European Commission set aside uh, used escape clause in the treaty and suspended the fiscal rules. They are still suspended, right? Um, and, and this, I think, was the correct decision because during a pandemic, in fact, the pandemic in terms of negative shock was even bigger than the financial crisis. Here I show you the decline of growth of GDP from the year 2019 to 2020, right? So, and here you can see Spain, for example, is quite a, a, a huge decline of GDP, right? Uh, among the biggest uh, and decline of GDP. But you can see quite a, a lot here, minus eight, minus 10 percent, huge decline in, in GDP. And happily, whoops. Yeah, happily we allow the budget deficits to increase, right? Here's the increase, see so the budget deficits, the change in budget balances from 2019 to 2020, the same year. And you can see huge increases in budget deficits. And we must say, happily we did that, right? Suppose we had not done so, the system would have collapsed. This also teaches us something about fragility of capitalism, right? Capitalism is a wonderful in human invention, right? It's, it's the only system that makes it possible to create material welfare. But it's quite fragile. When you have a big shock, it can actually implode, right? Because you have, a sh like in, during the pandemic, output declines because firms cannot produce anymore, income is not generated, people cannot spend. So you get into a vicious circle downwards. If you not control it, it can actually lead to a downward spiral, leading to great troubles economic and political, right? And we stopped that, happily so. And happily, <coughs> the Commission then decided at that time that <coughs> the, the um, fiscal rules should be suspended, right? So let me now say a few things about <coughs> reforming the fiscal rules. How should we reform it? Eh? And you already mentioned uh <coughs> the, the main idea. The main idea is that these fiscal, the numbers, 3, 60 percent, just don't make sense from an economic point of view, right? Uh, it, it just, it's just silly, it's just stupid. Why, why do we attach importance to three? Because of Trinity or something? It, it has no scientific basis, right? Yet we have been using this and imposing that on countries totally dissociated from scientific insights. So what should be done instead? Well, <coughs> here this sustainability analysis. You actually start making projections about future growth, future tax capacity, future interest rates. Of course, it's difficult to do so. Huh? In the future, we don't know very well, but that's the only way we can do. And that should be geared towards individual countries' situations. So therefore, it should not be uniform. It should not tell every country the same number, right? It should be based on the capacity of countries to grow, on the interest rates that they will face, and that then should determine um, whether or not there is a signal that um, is set in motion saying, oh, but this country is in trouble. And, and when a country is in trouble or risks to be on a path of unsustainable debt, that's when you want to interfere. But the others, you don't have to. You don't have to micromanage them all the time, right? Like the the stability and growth pact wants countries to do. And, in, and today it's still true that R minus G, or that R is smaller than G. R is the interest rate, the nominal interest rate, and G is the nominal growth rate of the economy. And since a few years, we have been in a situation where R is smaller than G. And that also is important because it actually needs that you have a dynamics where the debt to GDP ratio tends to decline automatically. And then you have to do other things than when interest rate exceeds the growth rate of the economy. So all these things indicate that you should do sustainability analysis based on concrete situations of countries and then 
and try to push countries into the right direction. And I think the European Commission now has gone in the direction of, of um, going towards sustainability analysis. The other point I want to stress here is that this analysis should be in terms of net debt levels, not gross debt. Um, the, the fiscal rules have been focusing on the balance sheet. You take the balance sheet of the government, you have the assets and liability side, and the fiscal rules close one eye. They say, we are not going to look at the asset side. We are only going to look at the liability side, the gross debt. And whatever happens on the asset side, we look at the gross debt situation. That doesn't make sense. We never do that when we look at private companies, right? When you want to know whether a private company is doing well, we look at the balance sheet, assets and liabilities. And if on the asset side there are good assets that create returns now and in the future, then if there's a lot of debt, that's fine. Right? But we don't do that with governments. We just look at the liability side and close our eyes for the asset side. That doesn't make sense. Right? So we, in that sustainability analysis, we will have to also look at the asset component. Right? Um, because if you do public investments, for example, you create an asset that hopefully is productive. Of course, it's important that we do the public investments correctly, right? that we create assets that will also have a return for society. But if we do that and we finance this by debt, there is no problem. Right? We, can, we, can, we can do it. And, and Every country can do it. Even a country that has a debt to GDP ratio more than 100% can do it. But this, is not, this has not yet entered the mindset in uh, the European Commission's proposal, unfortunately. So I want to stress this here. Right? There is an absolute priority to public investment. It is the key to overcome the environmental problems that we face today and to make economic growth sustainable. And note the following, public and private investments are often complementary. We have often, in economics, st students have been taught, oh, if there's public investment, this will crowd out private investment. And since private investment is better than public investment, let's not do public investment wrong. <coughs> public and private investments are complementary. If the government invests in infrastructure, um, power grids, for example, education, fundamental research. This also gives incentives to private enterprises to do more investment, and the two go together, right? So that's an important insight. We have to boost public investment. Uh, and, and these balanced budget rules, therefore, make no sense whatsoever, right? The fiscal rules today are still that governments will have to go towards balanced budget, right? Structural balanced budget over the business cycle. But that implies that public investment cannot be financed by issuing debt. Um, and, and that's a big mistake. Now, the European Commission, instead of looking at the deficit, wants an expenditure rule, which would dictate governments to, sp to keep government spending constant as a percent of GDP over the business cycle. But that would also mean that if the governments want to make public investments, they would have to reduce other spending items. So the idea that public investment can and should be financed by issuing debt is lost again, and that doesn't make sense. Today we are, as I said, in the arm um, smaller than G regime. Nominal interest rate is lower than nominal growth rate, and that creates an automatic <coughs> um, dynamic stability condition, right? The debt to GDP also tends to decline. And this is still, of course, the interest rates have gone up today, but G has also gone up. So we are still in a situation that um, public investments can be done with a rate of return that is very likely to be much higher than the cost of borrowing for governments, right? Why wait, right? Um, these investments are key to making economic growth environmental friendly and sustainable. And as long as this is the case, of course, this may turn around. At some point, R may start exceeding G, and then it will be a more difficult problem. But today, we are still in that situation. And then I would say, let's do it, right? And uh, there is no restriction on borrowing uh, to fund public investment, right? Except the restriction, expected returns on public investment should exceed the cost of borrowing. And most countries are still in that situation. And the, we should realize, but somehow there is a, 
there is a denial uh, in, in Brussels, they're still in denial about this very basic uh, fact. And unfortunately, the new proposals of the European Commission do not take that into account. So this is also the idea of gross versus net. I think I said that before, let me skip it. So that, that's one thing, right? Um, the reform should be um, based on sustainability analysis of the net debt, right? And, and making sure that we can continue to make investments by borrowing. Right? There's no problem for continuing to do it. Another idea is the bottom-up instead of top-down. Many of these fiscal rules have been top-down from Brussels, right? from Brussels, and that doesn't, has not worked well. So th th there is a need for a more bottom-up approach. There is an importance of national fiscal councils, right? And they are national, and, and they can, if they are independent, they can also make it easier to implement sustainability. Because remember, I'm, I'm not one of those who wants to minimize the need to maintain sustainability. It's quite important that we have sustainable debts and deficits, right? But the, the top-down approach has not worked very well, right? And the European Commission has made some proposals here in this connection that are quite uh, interesting, right? Final point I want to make <coughs> is that the governance of the um, public debt levels cannot be dissociated from the ECB's bond purchasing policies. As you know, the ECB has been buying a lot of these bonds, right? <laughs> government bonds, in, since uh, QE started. And actually, when you think about it, when the central bank buys government bonds, actually it's equivalent to a debt relief. Right? Because as long as these government bonds are on the balance sheet of the central bank, remember what happens, then the government pays out interest to the central bank. And what does the central bank do? It returns the interest to the government because these are profits of the central bank. So it's circular. It goes out of one pocket and comes back to the other pocket of the public sector. So if you have where to consolidate the balance sheets of the central bank and the government, they don't exist. Actually, these bonds on the balance sheet of the central bank cease to exist economically and they reduce the interest burden significantly of the government as long as that is the case. Therefore, it's important to integrate the policies of the central bank with the sustainability analysis that uh, we want governments to do. And that's not being done, I'm telling you. That's not being done, right? Um, the ECB has announced that um, it will st slowly start reducing um, government bonds on its balance sheet by uh, 15 billion a month, which is 180 billion a year. But since the total stock is about 5 trillion, that means it will take more than 20 years at that speed to eliminate the bonds, the government bonds from the balance sheet of the uh, Central I, I, I say ECB, technically it's not the ECB, it's actually the national central banks of the euro system, right? Uh, that's the technical term, like the Bank of Spain, for example, holds the Spanish government bonds, right? And the Banca d'Italia, the Italian government bonds, most of it was also a little bit held centrally by, by the ECB. So, uh, but, so we, we have to take all this into account, right? Because here this, I give you some numbers about... Um, the uh, share of government debt held by the central bank. Here is Spain, close to 30% of the government bonds are held by the Bank of Spain. So actually, in my analysis, these bonds don't exist, right, economically, because the Spanish government pays out interest to the Bank of Spain, and the Bank of Spain returns it. Well, I'm, I'm going back to that because now something else has happened. Actually, the Bank of Spain, I'm telling you, doesn't turn it back to the Spanish government, but to the banks. They really return it back to the banks. I will tell you more about this in a minute. Uh, so, and that has to do with massive subsidies. So le let me explain what's going on now. Because of the um, quantitative easing, banks have acquired large bank reserves, that is, deposits at the central bank, huge, right? Um, this is now, for the euro system as a whole, 4.3 trillion euros that are held 
by commercial banks at their respective national central banks. And now the euro system, because it raises the interest rate and it remunerates these deposits, pays 3% on these bank reserves. 3%. How much percent do you get on your demand deposits at a Spanish commercial bank, your current account? How much do you get? Zero, right? Well, the banks get now 3%. 3% for a deposit, just a current account deposit, 3%, huge amounts of money. Actually, the banks, the, all the banks in the European in Monetary Union now, at this moment, on a yearly basis, receive 130 billion a year. I, I remind you that the total EU spending a year is now 160 billion. So we are coming close to a situation where what the banks get from all these central banks is about the same as what the EU spends every year. Right? So that's really a problem, isn't it? It's really unacceptable that we do that. Um, and uh, it can be done differently. I've um, written a paper recently where I argue you could increase minimum reserve requirements of <coughs> banks and tell them the good news, your deposits there, you have to hold it and we will not remunerate them. Right? And, and eliminating a huge source of profit for the banks. Ba banks get rich with, while sleeping. Hmm? <laughs> we would all want to be banker, right, today. You just can get up in the morning and relax. The money is coming from the central bank, you know, you don't have to do anything. And 3% now, maybe next time it will be 3.5% extra money for central banks. That's a real problem, isn't it? So here I show you, yeah, uh, this is the 129 today, it's 129 billion transfer. If we raise the interest rate, if the ECB raised the interest rate to 3.5%, it will be 150 billion, right? My proposal is a two-tier system where you would say to the banks, okay, um, take 3 trillion, <coughs> minimum reserve requirements, zero remuneration. We will only remunerate everything extra, extra reserves. And then you still would have transfers on the extra reserves, but it would be much less, right, than what we have here. And the, the central bank would continue to do what it does today. If it wants to raise the interest rate, it can just raise it on the marginal, <coughs> on the extra reserves, they would remunerate them at the same interest rates but that would re massively reduce the transfer. Uh, he, I think I, I made some calculation for Spain. Spain today, <coughs> the Spanish central bank actually pays out to <coughs> banks in Spain 7.4 billion, right? Um, actually, Spain is, is not that much compared to other countries. Look at France here and Germany, even my own country, small country, Right? Almost as much as, as Spain. For some reason, Spanish banks have less bank reserves than other um, banks. Uh, so that's uh, my interpretation. I don't, I don't really know why, but you, you may know more about this, right? Um, okay, conclusion. <coughs> the argument, I've argued that f extra, f extra fiscal discipline in the monetary union is not really necessary. Fiscal discipline is necessary, but why we should do something extra in a monetary union is unclear to me. I've made arguments that this is not necessary, right? Uh, that's one thing. The current stability and growth pact is broke. It is incredibly complex. It has been built over the years, and, and it, it's, nobody understands it except maybe four or five people in Brussels understand this whole thing, right? And all the others don't. And then you give too much power to these four or five people, right? Because they're all here until you understand this. So we have to do something different. Um, how to organize fiscal discipline. Uh, we should not do that based on numerical rules. That, is, that doesn't work. Um, and <coughs> we have to uh, think about how we should do it. And the European Commission, I must say, has been making these proposals. I referred to that at uh, some moments, right? Oops. Uh, so I've argued non-numerical targets, <laughs> sustainability analysis. It's not an easy task because we really have to look prospectively. Um, but I think the European Commission uh, is a step forward, but still insufficient, especially in not allowing debt financing 
of public investment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I have so many questions, but I'll <laughs> refrain myself to two because I'm sure that you know, most of the audience also will have uh, many questions. But if you allow me, I just feel the need to add an, a little comment on, 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 on something that you explained very well, but I think it might just help uh, um, when you said that um, central banks have bonds of government in their balance sheets, which indeed is absolutely true, and that when they get paid these interest rates, they go back to the government. Uh, let me just clarify something on this just because I, I feel that that might be important. So what happens is that uh, central banks have a balance sheet that they have you know, assets and liabilities. The liabilities might be the deposits from <coughs> other banks and so on, and they have assets. And in their assets, they have lots of government bonds. And if the assets make more profit than you know, what they lose in the liabilities, let's say, 70% uh, of these profits go back to the treasury. Okay, so what it's true uh, is that there's some, some, some part of this, but actually not all the interest rates of the government bonds actually mean profits for, for, for central banks. Central banks also pay interest to the banks. Uh, so, so it's not, I just want, I know that yeah. you have it absolutely clear in your mind, but I just wanted to make sure that we all have it clear in our mind that it's not, you know, this rolling over of, you know, you get the interest rates from, from the government and then you return it. Eh? It's just part of the profits that uh, central banks have, that 70% of them go back to the treasury. And actually, now we might have some central banks that do not have profits for a while, uh -huh. huh? and then there will not be transfers. So just to clarify. But let me go to the questions. Um, so the first question has to do uh, with your proposal of uh, which, which I completely share about the importance that we continue doing public investment in these moments, especially now when we need to give you know, big support to the green transformation, the digital transformation, right? So many things are happening that we need to make sure that we can you know, have the right support and, and this complementarity uh, aspect of the public investment that you said. But what bothers me a little bit uh, in the way in which we would control for that, because there's the implicit assumption that this public investment is good, meaning that it will translate into, uh, you know, these, these, um, external, these positive externalities. But we all can come up with examples of public investments that are, mm, I don't know, questionable, right? Let's say in Spain we have some airports or we have some things that I don't know um, you know, how, how good of an investment they could be. So what would you propose uh, for <coughs> countries to do uh, to control, you know, this side, to make sure that the public investment is really uh, as good as it's supposed to be? And I know in theory it's supposed to be that, but mm -hmm. how would we put some discipline there? Okay, thank you. Important questions and comments. Let me first start with your comment about uh, interest payments of central banks. You, you use the terminology, the central bank um, has assets, it earns some interest, and also has liability, and this costly, it pays interest. But the central bank doesn't have to do that. It's a choice of the central bank to pay interest to commercial banks. It could do it perfectly without doing this. That's the problem that I have. Remember in the old days, we had a system where um, this is called the scarce reserve system, where um, the supply of bank reserves was relatively limited. This was pre-quantitative easing, right? Um, and then central banks, of, uh, sorry, commercial banks had very little amount of bank reserves. These were also remunerated, but this was very limited because the, the size of these bank reserves was really peanuts. And the central bank could then set the reference rate and then guide the supply of bank reserves so as to make sure that the interest rate in the market, the market interest rate, would be close to the, the target rate that it had announced. Right? This was the system prior to the financial crisis. Then came the financial crisis and quantitative easing. And that lead, led to a huge increase in the supply of bank reserves because the central bank was buying government bonds and in doing so creating deposits held by commercial banks. And there was a huge increase. That is are the trillions that we are talking about. 
for as, until last year, this was not a problem because the interest rate was zero or even negative in some countries. Mm, Therefore, there was no interest payments by the central bank. But now, when the, the central bank has to raise the interest rate to control inflation, the problem arose because um, the situation now is one where the supply of bank reserves is vastly bigger than the demand of reserves. So, in principle, when I would have to draw it on a, <laughs> on a blackboard, in principle, you could bring equilibrium in a demand and a supply by allowing the interest rate to be negative, right? The demand would have, the interest rate would become negative and then there's some point where it would hit the supply curve. But this is not possible. And therefore, there is a lower bound. This, there was for years a lower bound on the interest rate on deposits. And the way the central bank now raises the interest rate is by raising the rate of remuneration on deposits, creating this problem. So that's a relatively recent creation, right? It didn't exist before. And then now suddenly we find out that the central bank is making these massive transfers to um, commercial banks. And we have to put that into question. But I understand now, when I talk to central bankers about this, there is a kind of denial. It's like saying, we have to do it. It seems that's the only way. No, it's not the only way. You can do it differently. But of course, I, I know you want to listen, but I've been talking <laughs> to my own governor. He doesn't want to listen. Well, you, this, the way it is, it's like God has made that necessary that we do it this way. It's not true. You could do it without paying massive subsidies to commercial banks. So that's my point here, right? You could do it differently. It's not being done, and I think this is an unsustainable situation. We cannot go on paying every year more than 100 billion to commercial banks in the US system, right? I've made a calculation for the next 10 years, if we go on doing this, the central banks will have transferred more than one trillion of interest payments, subsidies to banks. And remember, these are deposits, risk-free. Commercial banks don't do anything. They, they, don't, they don't have to do credit analysis or something, uh, because this is a risk-free asset, right? It's even risk-freer than government bonds. And they get remuneration. Now 3%, possibly 3.5%, maybe 4%. And what do we get on our deposits? Zero. That's not, that's not sensible, right? We should change that. That's my point. On your second point, public investment by debt. Yeah, that's a big problem that you mentioned. I have not mentioned this, that that is really uh, a big problem. How do we control that these are real public investments, right? And it's not manipulated to, to have all kinds of nice things there that do not create um, real return for society because that should be the criterion. Public investment should create a return for society in the future. But yeah, there are m many white elephants, right, that you know and that I know. So we, that's, a, that's a real problem. We need some control. Um, and I think we should take as an example now what um, the European Commission does in the context of next generation EU because that's also an investment yeah. program. And how does the Commission do it? Well, it waits for national governments to hand over their plans about what they are going to invest in, right? And the European Commission then goes into the detail and, and then says, yes or no, this is fine, this is not fine, right? We need such a mechanism. Otherwise, indeed, it will be uncontrollable and this will not work well. But I think it works relatively well in next generation EU. And that's the, the format that I see we should use uh, for the future. Yeah. Perfect. I have, I, I, I'm controlling myself. <laughs> <laughs> Please <laughs> don't. Have, I don't. Don't do that. <laughs> but, 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 I don't um, control myself. I know, that's good. <laughs> uh, but let, let, um, so maybe if there's time, we can go back to, to this point, right? Um, because there are other alternatives, as you say, also what the, s the commercial banks are doing with uh, the compensation and deposits, it's part of the situation, right? But let me ask about what you came to present today. So the other question that I have, it's about the timing of the potential change of, well, change of recovery of these fiscal rules of the European Commission, right? Because now we are in exceptional circumstances. We are with the war in Ukraine recovering from COVID and all the investment that, that and extra spending that we had to do there. And when you decide things in special circumstances, 
you might, I mean, it's human, right? Mm -hmm. We might just think that these extraordinary circumstances are going to last long. I mean, that for sure will affect the way in which we decide what needs to be done with the rules. And I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, what this might, where this might take us. Okay, so that's an important question about the timing. I didn't mention that at all in my an analysis, right? When do you do it, right? Uh, of course, <laughs> the cynics will say there is never a good time, never. right? <laughs> um, but uh, surely sometimes it's worse than other times. So I, I can see the point that maybe we should wait even a little longer. That's what you suggest actually, right? Uh, wait a little longer. Yeah, maybe. Uh, <coughs> Although you could also do it in a gradual way, right? You could have a perspective, okay, we start doing this and um, ultimately we aim at uh, a year, a little further in the future to go in the direction. But <coughs> this being said, if we do it in the right way, like a sustainability analysis that I mentioned, then actually the timing is becoming less important. Let me give you the example <coughs> today. Um, as I mentioned, the interest rate, the normal interest rate on the government debt in most countries is still significantly below the nominal growth of GDP. As a result, the debt to GDP ratios tend to decline automatically right, without you doing anything. So <coughs> actually, if you take that into account in your sustainability analysis, you can actually say countries, well, for the coming years, where we expect the interest rate still to be low compared to the nominal growth rate of the economy, there is less need for you to reduce the budget deficit, the primary budget balance, for mm -hmm. example, um, in many countries, don't have to show a surplus to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. Um, so you can actually, in, if you do a sustainability analysis, you can actually take into account the timing, right? By taking into account the situation of growth and nominal interest rate. And of course, if that changes in the future, then you may have to be more strict uh, in the application of this sustainability analysis. So in that sense, um, the shift away from numerical values is a good thing because when you take the numerical values, it's 3%. And, and the debt to GDP ratio as a target is 60%. So and then you say, oh, irrespective of the timing, you have to reduce your debt to GDP ratio. That's what you do when you use numerical targets. But when you use a sustainability analysis, you take into account the timing, so to say. So, and that's, I think, the way forward. So definitely, given the circumstances, let's say, it seems, I, I'm trying to understand uh, uh, exactly what, what we are telling us. So it seems that it's very highly unlikely that we will go back to an arm, a number just because of yeah. the circumstances that we have now, right? I yeah. mean, if, if we... I mean, probably that's something that we will see, right? It's, it just seems very hard. Or at yeah. least if we go back to a number, we will need a very long transition. Because yeah, just yeah. coming up with a number right now, you don't want to say something that you can never satisfy, right? So That's right. If you asked me, I would eliminate the numbers. But that's, of course, not going to be possible. Because these numbers, 3% and 60%, are written down in the treaty, right? It's part of the treaty. Mm -hmm. Pardon? In the protocol. Yeah, that's part of the treaty, isn't it? You can, change. you can change, but you need, <laughs> you need unanimity. Everybody has to agree, right? Hungarians, for example, have to agree. Uh, and as, so people want to avoid this. So, and also, and there are a number of countries who do not want to change the numbers. Go to Germany, they don't want to change the numbers. Th and that's why the European Commission now, in its proposals, still uses these numbers. It, it says... It's, it's going to be a sustainability analysis, but ultimately it should be such that we satisfy these numbers, ultimately. And that's going to be a big problem, right? Because the, what are the Germans going to say? Ultimately? <laughs> mm -hmm. no, much quicker. And that's going to be a problem. So that's not really resolved at this moment. And, and um, in, in my uh, proposal, it will be a problem. And we would be able to, to cope with it, but... We don't really know what will come out, huh? because this is a proposal of the Commission. It's not clear what is going to be decided huh? with the Council, and countries may have different views on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it might be a hard one. So let's, yeah. uh, questions, Jose? Yeah. <coughs> I, I have a 
Uh, 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 a comment on, your, on the last point of the European Union controlling the, the quality of investment, we've seen it with Italy in this case. Now, when Italy wanted to uh, spend these funds on, on renovation of, of uh, soccer, uh, soccer uh, fields, and the <laughs> European Union has said, no, sorry, that's not allowed. So that's, that's good that the that's European Union example, is on yeah. top of that. Now, I, I wanted to go back to, so your proposal is a little bit, the going back to this question of rules versus discretion. Right. We have three or 60 because if we don't have a number, then everything gets very complicated. Sustainability analysis depends on many assumptions. Here in Spain, for instance, right, right now we have a big debate, well, not a debate because it, it passed the, the, in the parliament, but about the sustainability of the pension fund. All the experts say that the sustainability, the, the pension, the new system is not sustainable, and the government says that it is sustainable. So when you get, when you get into these debates about sustainability, uh, everything depends on many, many, many assumptions, and you go back to discretion. So basically, it's a political discussion. Who has more political power will decide if it's sustainable or not. So we need to tie our hands somehow. And in that respect, I think that going back to one number, whatever that number, I don't know what is the right number. I don't know if every country should have a different number. But if we don't tie our hands in some way, then the question is not the original question why the, you know, the fiscal complex was needed. For, for this monetary union. Now we have a question of democracy. So we have populism rising around. And populism is going to imply that, that many, many countries and many parties pushing for more public expenditure, no matter what, how much debt we have to get into. It's true that populist parties in the European Union countries, when they gain the, the elections, uh, before the election, they say they want to get out of the European Union, but then they say, well, perhaps we stay in the European Union, okay? But we need to put some limit to what they can do, because otherwise we know what is going to happen, which is debt is going to grow very fast because this is populism. And, and one point on your, on your figure on, the, on GDP, uh, on, on debt over GDP, when you compare the European Union with the United States and the other, and the other countries, I mean, this is not a fair comparison because the European Union was under the fiscal rules and therefore uh, obviously the, the debt to GDP ratio was not growing so fast as in other places because the other places didn't have already the treatment. No? So the, the European Union was already treated, the United States was not treated. So the comparison is a little bit, uh, so it's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not good. Okay, thank you. Oh, the, uh, uh, I wait no, for... No, you, uh, can, uh, you can answer. I, I was just... Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe <laughs> otherwise I forget all these uh, very interesting comments. Um, on rules versus discretion. Yes, of course, you have a point there, right? Uh, what do you do? And you, have, you tie your hands with the famous um, analogy of Ulysses, right? In his boat, and passing by the island, and these uh, beautiful women singing and would like to go to the island and... He asked his um, mates, his uh, colleagues, please tie me to the mast so that I will not do foolish things, but I can still hear the beautiful songs of these women. Right? <laughs> so that's the analogy of rules versus discretion. Um, but of course, we live in a democracy, right? <coughs> and rules, the way we have done it, take the 3% to 60% rule, that come down <coughs> right, from Brussels. Of course, it is all the result of a treaty. You can say, in terms of legal legitimacy, it's there. We have all signed up to this, right? But politically, it's not legitimate. Why is it not politically legitimate? Because those who enforce the rules do not pay the political cost of that enforcement. Who pays the political cost of that enforcement? These are the local governments and the local parliaments. And that's a very difficult problem. That's why we have seen in the history, it breaks down. When things are tight, countries say, no way. Forget the rules, right? And rightly so. And that's what the people want. And that's why it's very naive to think that rules <coughs> can be imposed top down in a democracy. And, and I think it's not a good idea. And, and, and the facts show that it doesn't work well. Now, <coughs> that's for the 30, sorry, the 3% and the 60% rule. The 
structural balance rule is actually a pernicious rule. It's a bad rule. Uh, you can argue 3% and 60%, okay, there's nothing in it intrinsically bad. It's silly. It's not intelligent. We agree on that. But the balanced budget rule of the business cycle is a pernicious rule for the reasons that I've given, namely that it makes it more difficult to finance public investment, right? And we need public <coughs> investment. This is of key importance, existential importance today. And we have, there we have tied our hands where we should not tie our hands. And, and there is an alternative. So the, the golden rule, right? <laughs> if we talk about rules, the, the famous golden rule could be applied here, where we say, okay, all current spending and taxation, that should go to the current um, budget, normal budget. And that should balance over the business cycle. But uh, capital budget, where we put public investment, should not be balanced. In fact, should be forbidden <laughs> to be balanced, if I may say so. You should, you should issue debt to finance public investment. And that could create an opening for governments to start investing more, right? We have for foolish reasons tied the hands of governments to do what is necessary. The, if today there is one thing necessary, it's public investment. Again, it has to be controlled, right? Uh, no no things that have nothing to do, but... And, and I'm not, I don't want to minimize this problem. It's not an easy problem, right? But that's what we should do. Um, the comparison that I made there, yeah, um, you know, certainly it's not <coughs> a full-fledged analysis, right? Uh, and I, I take your point. Uh, <coughs> but it is striking, though. But let's not forget that a number of countries have rules, right? Um, the U.S. has a rule. It has a debt ceiling. Um, and what happens? Well, <laughs> it's, it's increased all the time, except when the Republicans <laughs> have the majority in, in the Congress, right, like they are now, threatening to do, producing huge disruption, if they do it, in financial markets. But for the rest, yes, uh, I, I grant your point. I probably overstate um, the case uh, here. But, but still, um, there is no evidence that in a monetary union, um, there is a tendency for debts or deficits to, to be less disciplined than elsewhere. So um, I, I have three questions already that ask for their turn uh, a long time before, so I'm going to stop here the, the potential coming up questions just because of the sake of time. But uh, Enrique, and then we have another one there and one here. And sorry for the rest, but otherwise it will be really an overstage of the time. So. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you tried to convince us that, uh, to convince us that uh, a monetary union doesn't need particularly strong fiscal rules. Uh, and you used some arguments. Now you said that some of those were actually not very uh, full-fledged. But uh, I would say that uh, there's an additional argument that it's that I would say a uh, lack of fiscal discipline may uh, affect or may raise doubts about the integrity of the monetary union itself. In the sense that uh, countries that have issued debt uh, in, a, in a currency that they do not control uh, may run into sustainability problems. And to manage that situation, they may need to, in the absence of a lender of last resort, or a full-fledged lender of last resort, and we could discuss whether they should have one, but in the absence of that lender, uh, they may need to default on their debts. And to manage those defaults, they may be tempted to exit the common currency, which is actually what happened to Greece. Uh, now, if that's a possibility, now it suddenly raises the risk of uh, depreciation. You said it had disappeared, but suddenly, if that's a possibility, now there may be a depreciation risk premium assigned to that. Uh, you mentioned there was no contagion. I mean, actually, German debt uh, paid less <laughs> when there was the Greek crisis. But there was actually contagion from Greece to Italy or Spain or Portugal. So some countries were perceived 
who have suddenly that, uh, that uh, run uh, that, that risk. Um, there's also another point that you made on, on net debt, and you said, we do not look at net debt. Actually, I think that we do indirectly look at net debt, because when we assess fiscal sustainability, we take into account the growth capacity of that country. Now, the growth capacity, to a large extent, depends on those assets. So if you take uh, into account the growth capacity and you take into account uh, net debt, you actually may be kind of double counting the, the effects of those, uh, of, those, of those assets. So I don't think that's, uh, such, a, that's such a big problem to just focus on, on gross debt. And finally, I would, uh, I would make a case for, the, for a spending <coughs> rule. Actually, in a spending rule, you can uh, uh, separate uh, some spending, some types of, of, of expenditure uh, from others and leave some types of spending out of the spending rule. And you mentioned uh, that you would have, you would be forced to keep uh, spending constant as a percent of GDP. No, actually what the spending rule says is you, you can spend these, and if you want to spend some more, you have to raise additional taxes to pay for that. Okay? Um, and I would leave it there. Thank Let you. Let me just collect maybe all the questions, and then you can answer them. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So we have one question there. Good morning, Professor. My name is Anton Gasol from the Economist Association of Catalonia. It has been a pleasure to have the opportunity to listen to you. Thank you so much. Let me quote a brief paragraph from your investor speech as Dr. Honoris Causa at the University of, Mur of Murcia last winter. You said, if national bond markets were consolidated into a euro bond market, for example, next generation bonds, IAT, and a large part of national budget were centralized in a European federal budget in the form of a budgetary union, we would already have there would be no domestic bond markets. And you stated that is precisely the existence of national government bond markets that creates the fragility of the Eurozone and its potential to generate a speculative crisis. You ended by saying that this budgetary union in Europe is currently a dream. As we know, the annual budget of the European Union is nearly 1% of the GDP compared to 35% of the United States. Mm. I would like to believe in the aphorism that utopias are often premature truths and therefore go from utopia to increasing reality. Thank you. Thank you. And then we will have the last question and you can answer all of them if you don't see. Uh, here in the front row. I'm sorry for the other two hands that came later, but we have to respect a little bit the time given to, to us, which is already, we are already over time. Xavier Vidal Folk, El País. Thank you, Professor, for your presentation. It's so nice hearing about institution over numerical rules. It's not so frequent hearing about, about these things. But I, I'd like to ask you, about your expectations of uh, how these ideas could make make it progress in the in the coming months. Uh, there is a certain consensus, I guess, in commission in the commission and the ECOFIN about the idea of flexibility and enhancing the aspect of the debt in instead of the, of the um, public deficit. But besides that, I don't see, maybe I, I'm pessimistic, any indication that the, a pillar of your speech, which is the, uh, re, the recovery of the, of the uh, investment golden rule, 
could get his its way uh, easily. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, this idea hasn't been proposed in a, uh, included in a proposal from nor the Commission and not neither the the, the Council since ninety one by the the Lord's Commission, and so individually you have a, uh, you have a, um, mentioned uh, the Mario Monti Mario. position, but not collectively in a in a proposal. Even the last proposal of reform from the coming from the Commission says that uh, we should take note about the uh, golden rule, not, not the golden rule, about the public investment in order to um, in order to maybe getting a period di different periodification of the but not the real golden rule which excludes from the from the from the from the budget deficit the productive investment uh, so why should we should we be optimistic on that and if it was the case how distinguish which is productive investment from not productive or current spending is education uh, in productive investment who established the, the rule to distinguish to select one kind for, from another thank you thank you so okay thank you <laughs> quite a lot of uh, interesting questions that I'm asked. I hope I pass the exam. <laughs> 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 no, but thank you also uh, for um, the, the question. Let me start with the, the first ones. Uh, uh, so one additional reason you mentioned for having uh, extra discipline, because we talk about extra discipline uh, for countries that are in a monetary union, right? Uh, and so you say, well, um, a lack of discipline may raise doubt about the integri integrity of the uh, monetary union. Uh, in particular, um, countries that uh, come under pressure, uh, they are risking default, may actually decide to exit. And this may then lead to contagion and, and all that, right? Does that not need extra <coughs> discipline? I think it's a, a serious problem, but I, in, in a way, I, I believe we have solved this um, by the fact that it's now understood that the European Central Bank is the lender of last resort in the government bond markets. Right? It was unclear in the beginning of the sovereign debt crisis in 2010, 2011, whether the ECB would be willing to do so. And the fact that it was unclear and made this crisis possible, and also explains the intensity of this crisis. I showed you the yields of Greece and all that. And as soon as the ECB stepped in with Mario Draghi's famous speech in London, right, whatever it takes, and then in September 2012, the OMT program, the crisis disappeared. So I think one of the fundamental uh, components of a monetary union is that the central bank, the common central bank, is the land of last resort in a sovereign bond market, like it is in standalone countries. Right? Uh, recently, <coughs> there was a problem in Britain. The Bank of England made it clear that it would intervene, and there was no crisis. Right? This is also the case in the US. In all standalone countries, the central bank will always step in when the sovereign is in trouble. If the central bank doesn't like it, the sovereign will prevail. Right? And that is very clear. And so we should actually mimic, mimic that, and then there is no particular problem. And there might still be crisis and, and what have you, but we have the tools to deal with it, right? So, so that would be my suggestion. About <coughs> um, net debt, you say, well, we, we take into account the net debt by the very fact that um, in, in the sustainability analysis of the Commission, and that's what you have in mind, 
uh, we take into account the growth capacity of countries, and that's indeed uh, very good. But I don't think you really take that into account, because if that were the case, there would be no need to impose structural budget balance. Right? Structural budget balance actually says you do not take that into account. You may take that into account temporarily to you <coughs> when you say countries have to go back to normal, but normal means structural budget balance, which means no debt finance of public investment. So I don't think uh, <coughs> this is being done um, at the present time. On the spending rule, <coughs> yes, we have this this expenditure rule. This is the new thing, right? Uh, expenditure rule. I'm, I mean, it's fine with me, the expenditure rule, but the, the problem is, and in fact, you, 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 you told me that I'm right. You said when <coughs> you s exceed spending according to the rule, right, over the uh, business cycle, what did you say? You have to increase taxes. Yeah, <coughs> but that's actually accepting that <coughs> there will be no um, financing of public debt of, of uh, public investment by, by debt, right? So, um, yeah, that's why I, I think we, we, we still face the problem. The new fiscal rules do not incorporate um, the capacity of governments to finance public investment by issuing debt. So that, that's clear to me, and the spending rules are no exceptions to that. <coughs> rules <coughs> uh, versus... Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is the wrong <laughs> piece of... Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, your, your point, you are quoting me um, when I was in Murcia um, in October for an uh, honorary doctorate. Also a nice town, but not like Barcelona, of course, right? <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell them. What? We won't tell them. Yeah, yeah. Said that. No, I like Murcia. It's um, so, yeah, I, I was talking there about uh, euro bonds and budgetary union, and the, the, and the, the point that I made there, and, and I still make it, is that um, the source of the problem is that we have done the following. We have centralized money through the monetary union, given, uh, transferred our sovereignty in terms of monetary policy making to a common central bank, the European Central Bank, and that's fine, but we have not done so with the budget, right? That has remained mostly national. And, and that has created the problem. Remember, prior to the monetary union, crisis erupted regularly in the foreign exchange market. I showed you the, the spreads, right, in the 1990s. We had these huge spreads that came from speculative um, behavior. People expected the lira to devalue, and as therefore, 10-year government bonds will reflect expectations of uh, expected devaluation over the lifetime of the bond, right? So <coughs> all the instability and the fragility was focused on the foreign exchange market. Then the monetary union am actually amounted to abolishing this foreign exchange market. And then we thought we have abolished the foreign exchange market, so there therefore we have abolished instability. No. The instability shifted to the bond market, to the sovereign bond market. That's where the instability and, and the fragility was transferred to. We forgot this for about 10 years. I showed you the graph. During about 10 years, the spreads were zero. And then suddenly, people said, we have forgotten something. And all these clever guys, investors, woke up one day and said, we have forgotten something. These sovereign bonds are not perfect substitutes. And that's then hell broke loose, right? Um, and so that's the problem. So how do you solve this? By doing the same thing with the sovereign bond market, centralize them. If you really want the monetary union to survive in the very long run, that's the direction in which we have to go. Of course, I said it's utopia now. We cannot hope to realize this um, in our lifetime. <laughs> Maybe our grandchildren may see it. Um, but that's the direction we have to go, right? Uh, and, and so the important thing is that we indicate the direction in which we go, not that we realize it now, because that will take much longer time. But the direction should be clear. And that's why a year about next generation EU are good things, because it, it also indicates a direction in which we have to go, yeah? Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the, the skeptic, if I may, 
uh, call you this, but yeah, we'll ha one has to be, one has <laughs> to be skeptical. Yeah, uh, that, and and you correctly mentioned the golden rule, and by that um, we mean uh, the fact that uh, public investment um, can be put separately in a different budget. Right, um, has been proposed many times, Mario Monti, but actually. It has existed in the past in many countries. I don't know in this country, but in my own country and in France, you used to have a normal, a current budget and a capital budget. We actually did that. For some reason that I still don't understand, we abolished this and we put everything together. Uh, and that I think was a mistake. So it's not that it cannot be done. It used to be done and we changed it. So why couldn't we go back to it since it has existed? It's not that uh, unreal to think that we can do it because we have done it, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, it's not going to be easy. I agree with you. Uh, and there are all kinds of practical questions. One question that you mentioned is education, public investment. I think it is. But of course, should we consider the whole of <coughs> educational spending to be public investment? That's another issue, right? Uh, but surely education is investment huh? if there's one <coughs> form of investment, it is education, right? So let's do something about it, huh? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.